the Saints wrapped up minicamp, but another player controversy looms over the team as Junior Gallette played his last snap in black and gold. Plus, LSU's Omaha trip ends too early for Tiger fans. What went wrong for Palmineri squad? And this Father's Day was extra special for three Saints. This is the last word on sports. Fourth down on four starts now. The Saints wrapped up mini camp in their offseason program on Thursday, so there's no reason for players to be in the headlines for the next month unless it's for charity work. Welcome to Fourth Down on Four. I'm Leslie Spoon. Junior Gallette is once again in the spotlight for off the field issues. Lions Yellen has more on this developing story. Let's face it, the Saints are ready to put the past behind them, ready to move on from last year's 7 and 9 debacle, where they crashed and burned at nearly every turn. Through an off-season of tectonic roster shakeups, a humbled Sean Payton has talked about getting back to his roots, back to the things that made his team a Super Bowl champion and a perennial contender. I think we've had good focus. I think the obviously uh, leading up to, to this week, the attendance has been outstanding. Um, and I think more than anything else, when you're out here practicing, you want to see the details handled. Um, you want to see you want to see guys learn from the mistake they made the day before. And, and not repeat them. But oh, how the mistakes do have a way of repeating themselves. And what appeared to be a wildly successful offseason program has now been eclipsed by new noise from the past. That noise Peyton so often talks about avoiding has now grown into a deafening shrill thanks to this YouTube video of a March 2013 melee on South Beach. This video, which has now been viewed more than 600,000 times, appears to show linebacker Junior Gallette striking a woman at least two times with a belt before re-emerging in the scuffle to help rescue an associate who is being attacked by several participants. Gallette's attorney, Ralph Whalen, told Eyewitness Sports on Saturday, the man pictured in the video is not Gallette. But since then, Instagram photos from Gallette's now deleted account puts the sack man and his cohorts at the beach, all wearing the same easily identifiable attire seen in the video on the day in question. The Saints say they forwarded the video to the NFL and that the league office will make the ultimate determination regarding the pass rusher's culpability. Whether or not Junior Gallet is suspended by the league, the team can make a determination under the standard player contract that he's engaged in conduct that is detrimental to the team, that adversely affects the team, and they can terminate him. Even though there's a lot of guaranteed money in his contract, that guarantee protects against injury, skill, um, but not against conduct detrimental. So the Saints can do a lot in terms of potentially terminating the contract. What could be interesting is if Junior Gallette did indeed engage in that conduct on the beach, which you saw in the video, um, the Saints can argue that he knew he engaged in the conduct before he signed or re-signed that contract, and that voids the contract. That's an argument that the Patriots made in the Aaron Hernandez case. We might see it again here in the Junior, Le Junior Gallette case. But therein lies the problem. Should the Saints ultimately terminate Gallette's contract, you can fully expect the NFLPA to file a grievance on his behalf with the hopes of dampening Roger Goodell's power to adjudicate personal conduct matters. I think any time there is going to be a player discipline case under the conduct policy, again, whether it's the old policy or the new policy, we're going to see the Players Association fight, and we're going to see the Players Association try to pare back that power. Perhaps the video fails to paint a complete and wholly accurate picture of the events that transpired that day. However, what's inescapable are the chilling optics, particularly juxtaposed to his domestic violence arrest in January, one in which the Kenner District Attorney chose not to pursue charges. Under the old NFL conduct policy and the new conduct policy, under the old standard player contract, the new standard player contract, you do not need a criminal violation. You don't need criminal charges. You just need a determination needed by the team or the league that the player engage in conduct detrimental. Nevertheless, when Gallette spoke to the media for the first time since that arrest, he expressed optimism the league wouldn't dole out any punishment stemming from that January arrest. The case got thrown before he even got to court. So, uh... As far as my, my agent and my uh, lawyer is concerned, everything is good right now. And uh, we'll find out at the end of the month, you know, what was to be determined. But at this point, Gallette's prospects of staving off punishment look bleak, especially given the mounting circumstantial evidence linking him to the video. It's hard to think that this is not just the beginning. And, and I know we don't like to use this word around here, but you think back to the bounty scandal and that case dragged on and on and on. And this is a smaller issue. This is just one player. This is off field misconduct. But as we've seen with Ray Rice, with Adrian Peterson, now with Tom Brady, the Players Association is not willing to go down without a fight. And apparently Junior Gallette isn't either. Lions yelling.
And joining us now, Christian Garrick from WWL Radio. And what are your thoughts on Junior Gallette's latest off-the-field issues? Can he survive this? Has he played his last game as a Saint? I don't think he's played his last down or game as a Saint. And can he survive it? Yeah, I think he can. Uh, but then again, he's meeting with the NFL at the end of the month already. Right. And I just find it interesting, the timing of this video, the release of it. Uh, but also, Junior Gallette has shown a track record now of poor decision making. Not only going back to his days in college, but uh, in the NFL, he's put himself in some situations that ha have led to a lot of this and led to this speculation and this talk about him. And he had to defend himself uh, last week in the locker room. He talked quite a bit about his off the field discretion back in January and, and other things. Uh, so it hasn't, since he signed that contract in September, it hasn't really been a good 10 months. Yeah, no kidding. Now, should he get out ahead of this? talk to the media, share his side, or should he just lay low? Why should he if his attorney says that, it, that it's not him? I mean, you know, in other words, I don't think he will. I don't think um, he, the mindset usually, the strategy usually from these players is just kind of wait, let it kind of die down. Right. And then when you have to address it, you address it. They've never really been ones to jump out in front of things. Uh, I don't know that that's always wise. Right. Uh, but then again, when you're denying that it's you, and, it, and if you come out and make a statement, then maybe that validates that it is you. So I, I think it's kind of be to be determined if you are to be continued, if you will. Now, his production was down from 2013, but he still led the team in sacks. If he is, in fact, suspended at the end of this month, who will fill his void? For the well, Saints? Anthony Spencer, a veteran okay. that they brought in uh, to play. He's not the same pass rusher that he was a few years back with the Dallas Cowboys. Also, Haoli Kikaha, their second round draft pick. He's been impressive at times during uh, offseason workouts and uh, mini camps that we've seen. They've done a good job of at least if there's an injury there that we already saw with the pectoral injury, but if there was yeah. an injury or a possible suspension uh, at the time, they did a pretty good job of building some depth in case that happened. Now, Sean Payton has said on numerous occasions that a lack of leadership had a lot to do with the dismal season last year. We wrap up Saints offseason camp with Ryan Griffin's attack making headlines and now this. How can Sean Payton kind of get a hold of things? Well, I think he's, he's going to do a good job of keeping the team. Uh, he talked to him prior to setting him loose for training camp, and he talked to him about no news is good news. That's always kind of been the mantra. But you have to look at it and say, look, there's some things that have gone on over the last year, calendar year for this team, like the Ryan Griffin incident. And that's a, that, that might be an issue of just wrong place, wrong time. But again, it's decision making. Nothing ever good yeah, usually okay. happens after midnight. You know, we've heard that cliche. Uh, but, you know, I think Sean Payton, look, if he could have it his way, he'd have no distractions whatsoever. In today's NFL, I don't know that that's completely possible. You try to mit mitigate that as much as you can. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's something to, to pay attention to certainly for Saints fans, the more distractions you have. I mean, I've talked to Scott Shanley, Heath Evans, former Saints players that you know, often point to the fact that, look, when a team goes through the offseason or goes through a couple of years where there's no off-the-field issues, usually it's a direct correlation to winning. Right. Uh, let's talk more X's and O's now. Of course, they just wrapped up their offseason. You've covered the team for a long time. Did it seem normal? Did it seem like there was more installation, less installation? What are your thoughts on offseason in general? Well, I, I mean, I think that this time of year, you got to caution yourself to not get too uh, too far, too far, high on one particular <laughs> yes. player or too low because, I mean, we've seen guys come out in the past where they light it up in the preseason or light it up in the offseason workouts and then come preseason, they can't do anything and vice versa. They didn't look too good in the offseason and they came out in the preseason and regular season and did really, really well. So uh, I think that they're scaling things back. You, you hear from Sean Payton now, especially on the defensive side of the football. Mm -hmm. I'm very intrigued by C.J. Spiller. I think he's going to be an interesting find and an interesting piece for this offense because um, he's the kind of player that presents challenges to a defense, but also that Sean Payton has mastered at using his skill set and offenses in the past with Reggie Bush and Darren Sproles. Yeah, people say he's fast, but you just don't know how fast until you see him in person he's got great vision but he's got good hands too yeah I mean he's a great re receiver out of the backfield and that's the dual threat that Sean Payton didn't have last year in his offense that I think lacked and I think led to a little bit of the dip in production overall and the explosiveness not necessarily right. production but the explosiveness of this offense now he's got that weapon a little bit of a toy and I think Sean Payton knows exactly how to use him and CJ Spiller you can see him even though they're not hitting and tackling in these OTAs in mini camps you can see defenders struggling to get the angle the right angle on him it just it's a telltale sign that he's got a different gear. Definitely excited to see him. Happy Father's Day thank to you. you very thank much. you, Christian. Yeah, thank you. We're back with more fourth down on four right after this. Stay with us. Coming up, the Tigers finally got a win at the new park in Omaha, but couldn't get past the Horn Frogs again as Palmineri has to say goodbye to a number of key players. And later, we catch up with a trio of Saints with a special reason for celebrating this Father's Day. 
LSU returned to the College World Series after a one-year hiatus, but an opening round loss delayed the Tigers' championship hopes. Doug Mouton has more from Omaha. He got him, and it's all over. First and foremost, baseball has always been about pitching, and in their two College World Series matchups, TCU simply had much better pitching than LSU. It's a bitter pill to swallow because we came up here to win and uh, you know win the championship. But I think you know some of the some of the limitations we have got exposed a little bit. LSU's three games in Omaha each told a different story. Game one, LSU couldn't overcome four infield errors and lost to TCU. Game two, LSU cranked out 13 hits to roll past Cal State Fullerton. And game three, Johnny Holstaff ran out of gas as LSU's lack of starting pitching finally caught up with them. The fact that LSU won 54 games and an SEC championship and got to Omaha shows how good LSU's offense and defense was. But ultimately, the College World Series exposed LSU's shortcomings, and Paul Maneri talked about it after the game. The problem was simple. The Tigers simply did not have enough quality starting pitching. In 2015, amazing stories unfolded, like Cade Savick, a lightly recruited junior college transfer two years ago who became maybe the best catcher in college baseball and a fourth round major league draft pick. And this has been an amazing time for me here. Uh, something I've always dreamed of growing up. Um, I couldn't thank these coaches enough uh, for everything they've done for me, uh, everything they've taught me. Uh, it's just been outstanding for me. Just a wonderful time. LSU says goodbye to the Morapaw Masher and one of the best players in Tiger history. I just don't even want to think about life without Alex Bregman. Alex Bregman was the second overall pick of the Major League Draft. By this time next week, he should be playing minor league ball somewhere. He left Tiger fans with one final memory, a ridiculous defensive play in his final game in purple and gold. What a play by Alex Bregman! Just being able to represent such great people in Baton Rouge, represent um, just, a, just a fan base that really cares and really puts everything into their baseball. It's, 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 it's a special thing. It's, it's really such an honor and um, uh, I'll never forget it and I'll, and I'll always be thankful that I got the opportunity to play for LSU. We thought we'd win at least one national championship together, but you know, we've won a lot of games. We just couldn't win the last game of the year. And it's not just Savick and Bregman leaving. Of the nine position players who started for LSU in Omaha, only left fielder Jake Fraley returns. You know, after that game, I just kind of sat on the dugout and kind of take in one more time to the view because it's it is so cool to get here. The guys that are coming back, you know, we I know we we took some great stuff that we're going to learn from and we're going to try and put that to work for next year. Paul Maneri said the rebuilding work for next year has already begun, and he starts with one great piece. Freshman Alex Lang was brilliant in a complete game win in game two. He's back, and so is lefty Jared Poche, a solid second starter. But LSU clearly needs to find more pitching if the Tigers are going to have more success next time in Omaha. Reporting with the Tigers at the College World Series, Doug Mouton, fourth down on four. Back in 2009, when LSU won it all, they went five and one, only losing game two of the championship series to Texas. Since then, it's been tough at the new ballpark for the Tigers, losing to UCLA and North Carolina in 2013 and twice to TCU this year. With more from Omaha, here's Doug Mouton. Back at TD Ameritrade Stadium in Omaha, and Paul Maneri said it best. Joined by Glenn Gilbo, of course, terrific sports writer, covers LSU for Gannett Newspapers. Paul Maneri said it best. He said our uh, shortcomings were exposed, just not enough pitching on this LSU team, especially starting pitching, right? Yeah, if you're a national championship caliber team, in your third game, you're not throwing the whole dugout, you know, eight, eight pitchers. That, that just didn't look right. Um, but, you know, each of them, it, it really, it, all of them except one or two gave up hits, you know. So he, he tried everything he could. And really, when you look at it, they had a really good season. It came very far with one dominant pitcher and one pretty good pitcher starting line. You could actually say, yeah, based on that, the job that Paul Maneri and company did with this team was a terrific job based on the fact that I think every team in Omaha had better overall starting pitching. 
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, whenever you, you end your season in Omaha, it, it's a good season. And thank goodness they didn't go 0-2 again. So they, they got to win. They got to stay here a little bit. But, yeah, I, I think so. I, I think it's a, it's a very good season. Not a great season, but a, but a very good season and a better season than they've had. Probably the best season they've had since they won the national championship in, in 2009. Great offense most of the year. And they came a far away with one dominant pitcher, who, by the way, was a freshman. Yeah, then they get the pitchers back, so there is a chance to grow your pitching. Uh, you do lose one of the maybe the greatest player in LSU history. Certainly Todd Walker and he are the two greatest hitters in LSU history. Talk about Alex Bregman. You, you've seen pretty much all of the greats of LSU baseball. How does he rank in your opinion? Well, I think as, as, a, as a fielder, you know, probably the best shortstop. There's, there's been some better power hitters and probably all around hitters, better average hitters than, than Alex. But he looks like a guy who's going to have a good major league career. And that play he made out at shortstop, he ended up in shallow center field. I mean, at, at that moment, I thought, oh, maybe maybe they got a chance to, to pull this out. But but he was a great player. But there's a lot of great players on this team they're saying bye to. Jared Foster, Chris Chambra, Chris Chania. This team was loaded. And uh, Mark Laird, it's a shame they didn't get a little further. Yeah, it absolutely is. Now, uh, talk about the cupboard, what's coming back. We talked about the pitching. You got one position player back, and that's Jake Fraley. Uh, should LSU fans be concerned, or you think there's enough guys coming in, the big Delgado guys coming in? What do you think? Well, they got Alex Lane coming back, but, you know, the good thing about next season is there's not a lot of pressure on them to go back to Omaha because the last few years they had enough talent where they should get to Omaha, and they got there twice. This, this coming year, I don't think you can say, oh, they got to go to Omaha. So then they might have fun, relax, overachieve, and, and get to Omaha. But he's got to, you know, rec he, he's recruited well. He's got to find some players that, that are going to play right away. And he's got to find somebody to go with Poche and Lang, too, and, and, a, and a reliever to go more than, you know, an inning. Is the guy to go with Poche and Lang on this team now? Uh, possibly Jake Godfrey, but uh, I, I would say they're going to find a freshman somewhere to uh, to be a starter like they did this past year. Glenn Gilbo, terrific job. It was an interesting trip to Omaha. LSU does win one. It was a big deal. It was nice to get that win, but they go out one and two, dropping two to TCU. Reporting in Omaha with the LSU Tigers, Doug Mouton, fourth down on four. Still ahead is Cam Jordan, Mark Ingram, and Max Unger celebrate Father's Day. Why things have changed for the three with newborn babies to focus on. When we think of football players, we think of big, strong guys who play a ferocious game. It's hard to imagine they have a caring side until they start sharing stories about their children. We caught up with three members of the Black and Gold celebrating their very first Father's Day today. It's just a tremendous blessing just to you know, have a daughter or have a child, someone that you're looking out for, someone that depends on you. You know, it's like not about you anymore. It's all about them. Serious uh, perspective uh, shift, to say the least. Um, you know, your priorities are definitely uh, rearranged, you know. Uh, you know, you play this game for a long time and you're pretty selfish. You know, you get a lot of, a lot of free time and all of a sudden you get to, <laughs> you have to be in charge of another one. So it's, uh, it's definitely interesting. Mark Ingram's daughter, Mila was born on Christmas Eve. Max Unger's daughter, Cameron, was born late May. Cam Jordan also recently joining fatherhood. It's been a pretty good couple of weeks for the 25-year-old defensive end. It was like, oh, I got a new contract. What am I going to buy? Oh, diapers. <laughs> That's what I'm buying first. Great. Cameron's firstborn is a boy, Caleb Tank Jordan. And so far, it's been smooth sailing for dad. I just wake up in the morning, go to work, come back, play with him a little bit, and sit, give him right back to mom. He doesn't need me for much right now. Uh, the feeding and diaper change is all in her hands. How long can he possibly expect that to last? Hopefully as long as it can. <laughs> I'm, riding, I'm riding the wave. She's like, Man, she's like, hey, you know, just go to practice and focus on practice. I'm like, yeah, that's what I need to do. Focus on stri strictly work. Come over, give him, I give him kisses and love, and that's my plan. Like, hold him for an hour and a half, two hours, and then give him back. It's, it's, we're rolling right now. But Saints off season wrapped up this week, so Jordan has over a month to learn how to change those diapers. She doesn't know that. Get... She doesn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> as far as she knows, tomorrow I'll be back at work, <laughs> working out, and uh, I get, get some two-a-days in, you know. It's going to make me a better player because I'm going to be more motivated to stay here. Jordan's teammates seem to be a little more hands-on. You know, it's been good. You know, I train, I come to work. 
but you know I always have time for my for my baby when I get home. Usually I would take a nap, but now I'm playing with her or messing with her now, so um, changed a little bit, but for the better. For Unger, the birth of his child was planned around football season, but even then there were complications. We had it worked out pretty well, and then uh, you know the trade went down, and so threw a little bit of a wrench in the system, uh, you know, as far as me being across the country. But luckily, I just happened to fly home, and uh, you know my wife gave birth at the perfect time. Unger won a Super Bowl with Seattle, so what's better, having a kid or earning a ring? Man, that's a, that's a push right there. I, the, the best would have been to have you know my daughter at the Super Bowl, but uh, we'll, I guess we'll have to go back again. And that's exactly what Saints fans want to hear. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We're back with more fourth down on four in just a few minutes. Tomorrow's a big day in sports locally. The Pelicans will introduce Alvin Gentry as their new head coach, and he'll hit the ground running with the NBA draft on Thursday. And the College World Series championship round starts tomorrow as well. For Doug Mouton, Lions Yellen, photographer Adam Nay, and producer Danny Rockwell, I'm Leslie Spoon. Thanks for joining us.